I'm going to present you so how machine learning can enhance uh, user experience in virtual reality. Uh, so the first thing we may ask is, what is virtual reality? So virtual reality was a term um, spread by uh, Jaron Lanier during the 80s, the 80s uh, and it refers to something that is almost real, but still quite not real. Uh, so we have an illustration of what uh, people might think about uh, what is virtual reality. And actually, there are several uh, levels of immersion uh, that uh, still refers to virtual reality, known as the Milgram virtuality continuum. So on the full left, uh, we have the real world as we live in, so without any screen, any computer-generated content. And on the full right, we have something that is close to what uh, uh, the movie The Matrix represents. So for those uh, who don't know what The Matrix is, it's a virtual world uh, so realistic that uh, and w in which people are so immersed that they are even not aware that this is not the real world. So between this, uh, those two extrema, we have a different level of uh, immersion. Uh, so we can have an example of an augmented reality um, scenario in which, uh, for instance, a technician can have a look at the machine uh, to have it, uh, additional information to know how to service it. Uh, we can integrate a uh, video stream from cameras uh, into head-mounted displays uh, to integrate r uh, real um, items from the real world into the virtual environment. We can have non-immersive virtual reality um, to display information on the desktop screen, or we can even go further with the immersive uh, real virtual reality uh, that is, uh, for instance, illustrated uh, on the, this uh, picture, in which the participant is really immersed uh, into the virtual environment. So to achieve such high level of immersion, uh, head-mounted displays needed to be uh, developed, and the first one uh, was uh, designed by uh, Ivan Chevrolet in the 1977 uh, during his PhD uh, uh, in the MIT. And uh, the device was uh, so heavy that it needed to be mounted on the ceiling. Uh, and the information display at that time were quite basic. Uh, he already defined that the, the ultimate display would be a display that might be able uh, to replicate some physical uh, interaction. For instance, if uh, it would display a chair, one would be able to sit on it. And if one was about to take a bullet in such a virtual environment, these people might be able to die. Uh, so, of course, nowadays we don't have such kind of uh, immersion uh, level, but still we made like quite a lot of progress. We have a um, professional uh, device uh, and more consumer grades one. So for gamers, most of them already know the HTC Vive or the Oculus Quest. Uh, and uh, nowadays devices are even standalone, which means that we don't need to buy a gaming rig to be able to play video games on those devices. So a little bit of um, a bit of caution on the terminology. In the industry, immersion is often used to refer as the involvement of the player into a virtual on, into the virtual environment, whereas in the academics, Mel Slater defined uh, the immersion as the what the technology can deliver to the to the user. Uh, so those are mainly technical characteristics, as we can see on the right. So it can be the field of view of the device, it can be the refresh rate, the color fidelity, uh, all those kind of uh, technical aspects. Uh, so yeah, the word is really to uh, make the distinction between uh, the immersion uh, referring to the characteristic uh, in the academics and on the subjecting feelings uh, which can be uh, felt by the users. So presence. Uh, is the subjective response of participants uh, to uh, what the immersion delivers. Uh, and it uh, describes how the user reacts in the virtual environment. So we can see, for instance, uh, someone walking on a small path uh, and he extends his arm. So he has the feeling that he might be able to fall, although he's uh, walking on a flat um, surface, so which gives hints about the fact that the, this uh, uh, player is feeling, uh, experiencing presence. Uh, as presence is a subjective feeling, it means that everyone has a different level uh, of presence to the same stimuli, so the, to the same immersion. 
and a good um, wor wording to illustrate presence is really the feeling of being there. And uh, once more, uh, presence should not be uh, confounded with uh, the involvement, for instance, into a game. An illustration of uh, a scenario in which a user might be uh, might feel presence uh, was an experiment we performed in collaboration with a VR rescuer, so a Swiss startup, in which we ask participants to perform CPR uh, in a virtual in a virtual environment. So the idea was to have a really simple setup, only composed with two trackers, uh, and ask participants uh, to train themselves at performing CPR. Uh, despite the simple setup uh, involved, uh, we still managed to reach a sufficient uh, amount of presence, given uh, the involvement of participants into the scene, the deformation of uh, the virtual body of uh, the mannequin. Uh, and uh, we observed that uh, even with uh, haptic feedback, uh, we had better performance uh, for the training of the users. Um, so, given the previous example and also uh, one illustration of what we can have in virtual reality, uh, many applications still don't include the full body animation. Uh, and the, full, the fact that we have a virtual body uh, is really important if you want to have a referential uh, into the virtual, virtual environment. And uh, providing simply an avatar in uh, this virtual environment is not, is not sufficient uh, for ones to embody it. So Kiltenial defined the sense of embodiment as a composition of uh, three subcomponents, which are the sense of self-location. So I am located where the virtual body is located. This can be achieved by having uh, the camera located at the position of the virtual uh, head. The sense of agency, which is the fact that I control the movement of the virtual body as if I was controlling my own body. And the sense of uh, body ownership, ship, which means that I own the virtual body I see. So for instance, if uh, uh, the arm is collocated with the, the, present, the location of my uh, real arm. So the question is, how do we provide users uh, with a virtual body? Uh, so the first thing is to have an interface between the real world and the virtual world and the computer um, so that the computer knows what is the current uh, posture, for instance, of the users. Uh, this uh, interface needs to be real-time compliant, as uh, Farrar Al showed that beyond 300 milliseconds between uh, user action and uh, the perception of the reaction, uh, we may have a disruption of the sense of agency and disrupting agency also disrupt uh, the sense of embodiment. And uh, unfortunately, most of the tracking um, solution are often, to, often subject to artifact. So here we have uh, an example of a, um, a tracking of a mocap solution. So there are several uh, technology to acquire uh, user's motion. We can have camera-based uh, solution and uh, camera-free solution. For the camera-free solution, we can have a uh, magnetic field uh, sensor, which are co um, located uh, in the 3D space. And given the magnetic field, we can recover its position, although it is quite sensitive to uh, metallic uh, parts. We can have a mechanical uh, solution. So this one, the illustration is a bit old, but the idea is, for instance, to have uh, strips on, for instance, a glove, and when those strips uh, get bent, uh, the resistance of the material changes, and we can recover um, so the bending of the fingers. Uh, or we can use accelerometers. So we define uh, initial position, and then after integrate uh, the, ac the acceleration over time uh, to maintain the position, but those kind of solutions are often subject to drift. On the other hand, uh, we have camera-based solution. Uh, so we can either uh, equip um, users with markers, uh, which is the case for active and passive tracking. In the active case, we only have, uh, uh, we have uh, LEDs that, use, uh, that are used as markers, which give additional information. Uh, and on the passive one, it's just like a uh, reflective uh, uh, sphere, for instance. On the computer vision side, it's just uh, using, for instance, an RGB uh, camera to recover uh, some uh, features, so for instance, a point in 3D space. Uh, an example of a solution that uses computer vision 
is uh, the tracking from the Oculus Quest because we this device is made made to be standalone, which means it doesn't have access to any external tracking. Uh, so it needs to be able to locate itself in such a way that if uh, someone is about to turn on his head on the right, the vision also uh, shifts to the right. And uh, this uh, complex schema is mainly here uh, to illustrate the fact that um, uh, machine learning is only used in a small part of uh, the whole pipeline. So uh, really the, the idea is only to use for instance, a traditional algorithm to take care of what traditional algorithms are really designed for, and machine learning to cover, uh, for instance, parts which are more designed for the machine learning. So the idea is really to have an integration instead of having one thing doing the whole uh, uh, process. Uh, more in line with uh, what uh, we performed in, uh, within uh, our lab, uh, we implemented an animation pipeline for uh, hand animation. Uh, and we used uh, optical tracking. And one uh, issue we have is that if uh, both hands are overlapping, uh, we have what we call occlusion, so the camera can no longer see the position of the trackers. And uh, this prevents the whole animation of the hand. So to address this issue, uh, we used a uh, noto encoder, which is a, a type of uh, neural network, which aim uh, to retain the core meaning of a data set. Uh, to fill those occlusion. So the idea was to extract uh, the fingertips position within the hand referential, and then after uh, train the neural network uh, so that uh, the input matches is exactly the output. Because if we don't have any occlusion, basically we expect to have as an input the output. And during the training, we introduce uh, artificial occlusion, so we cut off some of the inputs in such a way that the neural network uh, get familiar with those kind of occlusion and get uh, robust to this situation. And once the neural network was trained, it was integrated in the real-time pipeline uh, to animate, uh, to fill all the occlusion within the hand referential. So now, uh, let's say we have all the information from the tracking solution without any occlusion, etc. How do we do to animate uh, an avatar? Uh, so there are several ways of animating an avatar. We can either uh, deform an existing mesh or we can use a skeleton rig. Uh, using a skeleton rig allows uh, to represent the whole avatar position with a set of uh, rotation for each joint. Uh, and this allows also to enforce the, some constraints such as the bone length, for instance. Uh, in machine learning, most of the time, uh, the feature is corrected are the location of, for instance, the joints, which means it's more complex to enforce uh, bones uh, length. And also, if you only define a bone with two points, it means you can have any rotation uh, that makes the bone still passing by those two points uh, potentially a valid solution. So if we have the position of the effector, so the targeted position, uh, so let's say this is the position of the marker and this is the kinematic chain that represents my arm. If I want to have the arm reaching the position of the target, we need a tool that is called an inverse kinematic. And it takes into input uh, the kinematic chain and the targeted position. And then it's, called, uh, it's to compute all the joint rotation to satisfy uh, the fact that the, the effector matches the targeted uh, position. So there are several uh, methods that allows, uh, uh, that can be used uh, to solve those kind of problems. We can have an analytical method uh, which um, uh, takes basically uh, mathematical formulas and you can invert it to retrieve uh, the angles, but it's not always applicable, especially for uh, full body animation. We can have a Jacobian Bayes method, so it's more compute, it's more, um, uh, heavy in terms of computer, uh, computational cost, or we can also have data-driven uh, approaches and hybrid methods. Uh, if we go back to the animation pipeline for the hands, we used a data-based uh, uh, animation, uh, where we, uh, in addition to the position of the fingertips position, we had information from uh, accelerometers that were used to have a ground truth for uh, the joint rotation. And uh, once more, we use uh, an auto encoder uh, to be trained with the input of the fingertip position 
uh, and as an output the ground truth uh, to uh, recover the to predict sorry uh, the joint rotation um, of uh, each of the finger and at the end uh, having a realignment process to make sure that the fingertip is always aligned with the marker at the end of the fingers so this is an example of the result we have. So we can see in green uh, the position of the input uh, from uh, the mocap. Uh, the sphere, when they turn uh, black, means that they are uh, occluded. So it means that it's no longer seen from uh, the motion capture. Uh, and we can see that uh, even if we have some occlusion, the system is more or less uh, able to fully recover the position, so we can have uh, hand checking, and uh, we can also have hands like almost completely uh, occluded. And so this is one way to animate, but we don't necessarily need to have something that is really realistic. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the paper cool move, uh, the the author only took uh, the inputs from the controller and the head mounted display. So this is really a simple setup. And uh, they, uh, they use a recorded, pre-recorded data set uh, of uh, sportsmen in different type of sport uh, to animate the full body avatar. So the idea uh, was to construct, uh, to extrapolate the data set of the uh, sportsmen only taking into account the controller position uh, within the head referential with also the velocity and the acceleration to scale up and down the speed so that if the, the user performed the motion more or less faster, uh, we can still have uh, the recognition of the poses. Uh, the data set is then uh, trimmed down uh, for each frame uh, in order to only retrieve frames that are more or less close to the current position of the user. And then uh, the nearest poses are computed for each, uh, based on each arm, and then after interpolated to reconstruct the position of the full body. Uh, at the end, there is also a final smoothing uh, of the animation to avoid jitter. And we can see on the pipeline that we have the initial pose taken into account, so only the position from uh, the controllers and the head here that leads to the final pose here. So as we can see, we have some difference in the animation of the feet. But um, uh, the question is, is it really um, a huge matter or not? And uh, some study showed that uh, humans are quite tolerant to motion distortion. Uh, typically, Burns and Al uh, studied the distortion, for instance, uh, when uh, a hand was about to go through uh, a table in virtual reality. So here we have the position of the real hand and the position of the virtual hand. And the idea was that the user accept more uh, a hand that stay above the table than the hand that goes through the table. Uh, and the values are uh, quite important. We can uh, have a tolerance about like uh, 45 degrees uh, in the elbow joint without a uh, user noticing if uh, this uh, is uh, correctly done because we are more focusing on the visual feedbacks than on proprioception. Uh, and this is uh, even more important if we help participant, if we use the voice distortion to help participant to achieve uh, some goal. So as uh, voice distortion are, uh, the tolerance for voice distortion are uh, different uh, for each participant. Uh, it needs to be calibrated if you want to be able uh, to use it without breaking uh, the embodiment. And this is uh, the work of one of my colleagues, uh, so Dr. Porsu, uh, who used um, a mix of uh, e-greedy e um, policy and upper, bound, uh, upper confidence bound algorithm uh, to detect the maximum threshold uh, for each participant. So the idea was to have a, this, um, a reaching task in which participant needed to follow uh, the targeted sphere in the green. And uh, the real position of uh, the arm is displayed in red, but not visible to the subject. And the displayed position is in solid gray. And uh, it played with the amount of distortion that can be introduced. And the reward for uh, the algorithm uh, was the gain of the distortion if the distortion went uh, unnoticed, and the opposite of uh, the distortion if the gain 
uh, was uh, observed by the participants, which means that uh, the algorithm, the goal of the algorithm was to increase as much as possible uh, the gain without having someone noticing it. And uh, his results show that uh, reinforcement learning was uh, better at providing a robust uh, detection threshold uh, than traditional uh, methods such as the staircase. Um, so, during, uh, in the case of my thesis, I am working on the embodiment of uh, avatar with different uh, shapes and proportion. And uh, we need to use those kind of distortion to be able uh, to embody avatars with different uh, shapes. Uh, and the animation pipeline, although it's not uh, machine learning, is kind of similar in the way that the computation of uh, the virtual uh, effector's position is a sum of uh, weighted uh, vectors uh, toward the body of the real user. Uh, and uh, this animation also needs to be um, within the range of the tolerated uh, distortion. So to finish with a uh, few insights uh, on how machine learning can also help uh, the user's experience in virtual reality. Uh, one of the main issue we have in virtual reality is the motion sickness, uh, which occurs when we have a conflict between uh, what our inner ear told us, for instance, the fact that we don't move and what uh, the visual clues uh, tell us. So for instance, there is an acceleration. And uh, we can use uh, uh, physiological data uh, to try to predict if someone is about to getting sick in uh, this virtual en environment uh, or to try to understand what are the causes of uh, this sickness to allow developers to be able to uh, build games that won't uh, lead people to be sick. Another illustration of uh, uh, cases where machine learning can be used is uh, in pose uh, recognition if you want to have a bidirectional bi interaction with your in your game and to allow user to express uh, uh, meanings through the hand position. This can be useful also for uh, rehabilitation uh, with uh, introducing distortion to help participants uh, to perform a task to motivate them uh, in such a way that they will recover uh, in the end, uh, more uh, motor skills than uh, people without it. Uh, to generate a um, virtual world uh, for uh, games or also to recognize the emotion uh, in the simulation. So I would like to thank my two thesis advisors, so Dr. Renaud Boulic and Bruno Herbelin, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I have a question. How far are we from having real, uh, real life avatars in video games? So instead of having like um, a virtual um, avatar that is not like realistic, like in a certain point of time, are we gonna be able to like live it in ourselves, like with our, re with our real bodies? So uh, thus far we are um, almost able to have like um, animation of the hand that works perfectly fine. For instance, uh, Oculus, um, so uh, Meta, sorry, um, now released a new version of uh, the tracking solution for the Oculus Quest, which also allows uh, be manual interaction. So before we were not able to have a hand overlapping. Uh, and also some startup are investigating for tracking system uh, with uh, cameras a bit uh, outside of the HMD to be able to locate the position of uh, all the lanes. But uh, one thing that needs to be taken into account is that uh, when you try to reach uh, realism, you have uh, what we call the uncanny valley, which means that the closer you reach uh, the realism, there is just a gap before uh, having the highest level. So people might prefer to have, uh, let's say, a wooden uh, avatar uh, that uh, will kind of smooth the imperfection of the animation than having something that looks almost as real as a, a real body, but uh, with a small imperfection that will make that the avatar you see is kind of uh, someone really creepy because the animation is not uh, perfectly fine. Uh, je me posais la question, le fait de qu'on puisse projeter un avatar, donc euh, on, on repre, reprend quelque chose qu'on est actuellement en train de faire dans de l'informatique, donc on numérise tout ça mm -hmm. et on crée un, donc un avatar informatique qui peut lui aussi être reprojeté dans, dans des machines avec les capteurs associés, les joints associés et les vérins associés, parce qu'au mm -hmm. final c'est 
un peu le, le contre-procédé de ce qu'on a fait avant, donc euh, l'acquisition et, la, et le, le rendu. Et euh, est-ce qu'il euh, y a des applications qui sont intéressantes Je pense déjà par exemple la médecine avec le, le télétravail du médecin et euh, au-delà de ça aussi un peu le... Alors c'est un peu fantasmé encore, hein, on est encore dans le futur parce que c'est quand même des technologies qui sont assez futuristes, mais pas tant que ça parce que comme on voit sur les vidéos, ça, ça a pas mal déjà avancé. Euh, est-ce que les, les guerres un peu robotiques, c'est une possibilité euh, on parle dans les 15 prochaines années est-ce qu'on peut, peut maintenant par exemple si on se met dans un laboratoire avoir un robot parfaitement animé avec les mouvements qu'on fait euh, mmh. euh, avec des capteurs je veux dire euh, est-ce que le télétravail robotique c'est possible alors il me semble qu'il y a un professeur japonais qui a effectivement fait ça avec un avatar à euh, son image euh, très réaliste et qui avait carrément il me semble envoyé son clone euh, donner un cours et sans que les personnes il me semble ne s'en rendent compte mais ça a vérifié, mais il me semble que ce genre de choses est donc déjà plus ou moins déjà euh, faisable. Okay. Oui. D'accord, bah, merci beaucoup pour, pour votre réponse. Je t'en prie. J'avais deux, deux questions. La première, vous avez dit que vous faisiez appel à l'apprentissage par renforcement. Mais mm -hmm. euh, avant de converger, c'est assez long. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut mm -hmm. répéter beaucoup euh, les tâches. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous dire euh, si ça ne pose pas un problème euh, euh, l'apprentissage par renforcement de ce point de vue-là. Et la deuxième question, c'est très bref, je vous ai mentionné la vallée de l'Intran, je ne connais Valais. Euh, Est-ce que vous avez testé, est-ce est que vous avez montré qu'il y avait effectivement euh, euh, ce sentiment euh, très désagréable lorsque l'avatar se rapproche vraiment de la réalité Parce que c'est une, une hypothèse qui a été émise par euh, euh, un, un chercheur en 75, mais elle n'a jamais été vraiment totalement validée empiriquement. En tout cas, que je, cherche, je cherche, mais je, je ne sais pas. Voilà. Mmh. Euh, donc, pour la première partie, avec euh, donc, euh, le reinforcement learning, il me semble que ça devait être effectué sur peut-être euh, une centaine de trials. Donc, euh, c'était une combinaison en fait, euh, de l'UCB et de Iglili Policy. Euh, au début, euh, c'est essentiellement des décisions qui sont prises au hasard, et puis après, ça laisse plus, euh, de plus en plus la place à, euh, à l'UCB. Et le, gradient, enfin, et le learning rate diminue aussi de plus en plus pour que le système se force à converger de, de, par construction. Euh, donc ça, c'est l'approche qui a été en tout cas utilisée donc, par mon collègue. Euh, donc voilà, donc il y avait une convergence aux alentours, il me semble, d'une centaine de trials. Il faudra que je vérifie dans le papier. Euh, mais donc, de toute façon, c'était assez limité par construction pour être sûr qu'on arrivait à une convergence. Et pour la deuxième euh, question, donc sur le test de l'Uncali Valley, je ne l'ai pas testé personnellement. Euh, et je n'ai pas le state of the art là, tout de suite sous les mains pour pouvoir vous répondre. Allons-y. Hi, so my question will be in English. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to ask, like, I don't know if you presented much about your current, I think you're doing your thesis at the moment. Mm -hmm. So how is your progress with that? And, you know, what are some of the findings that you've, done so far or like how far have you reached in your research and answering your research question and also my second part to my question is what do you hope to see like coming into the future with VR and also immersion like what do you want to see as um, happen in the future or what things do you want uh, more to be investigated okay uh, so for the first part Uh, well, it's kind of complicated because uh, initially you make like a plan of what you are about to, to do during your uh, uh, thesis and it's never as you planned. So I worked on different, uh, different topics. Uh, some are, are a bit less uh, in line with what I was expecting to work on and uh, obviously I'm a bit late, delayed at least. Uh, so, but I guess it's kind of the traditional pattern for uh, doing uh, a thesis. Uh, and uh, for what I am expecting to have uh, in uh, the future, so um, I expect to have like uh, even more powerful uh, HMD that takes advantage, for instance, of uh, upscaling uh, of the picture to only focus on the render rendering of some uh, area, which is called the, the fovea rendering, where uh, you focus, you use the data from the eye tracking uh, to know where the people is looking at. And then after you compute only high resolution picture in this uh, spot uh, area, you have like uh, less accurate information on the edges. Uh, so um, yeah, with the increasing uh, technology, I mean, if we use this kind of technology, we can spare more resources to increase, the, for instance, the tracking. Um, 
so yeah, once more we can have a higher tracking uh, data, so maybe one day a full body tracking without having any external uh, devices. Uh, hopefully it will be like completely um, s uh, sensible to uh, occlusion or all those kind of uh, issue. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we need to wait a little bit to be able to see uh, those kind of thing, but I really hope it will happen one day and hopefully not uh, in decades or those kind of things. Yeah, I just want to ask maybe one little thing, like how would full be a, a like rendering be able to help better with the full body tracking? Like the no, it, it won't help uh, okay. directly for a full body tracking, but uh, if you use Fovia rendering, you will uh, uh, save some computational resources that can be after uh, used for something else, or it can just be used to cut off some uh, energy consumption to be used on another chip uh, for uh, that is more dedicated for full body tracking. It's not like directly linked, it's uh, just that if you spare some uh, yep. uh, resources, you can reallocate uh, those resources to something else. So you find is that that's like the new, like the direction that VR development should be going is towards more full body uh, I guess they are working on many different topics at the same time, so uh, the tracking of course is uh, one uh, field of uh, interest, uh, but also yeah, uh, on the rendering process, uh, uh, and uh, de decaying like uh, hardware chips to take into to take uh, some uh, workload that are done by the CPU that can be shifted to uh, some uh, accelerated uh, uh, chipset. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Good Thanks. luck with your thesis. Thanks a lot. Donc dans cette présentation, Monsieur Delahaye nous a présenté euh, différents exemples d'algorithmes en machine learning pour améliorer l'expérience utilisateur en réalité virtuelle. Alors, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire l'expérience utilisateur euh, On a parlé en fait de l'importance de simuler la présence ou aussi du sense of embodiment, comment incarner en fait un avatar, parce que créer un avatar n'est pas suffisant. En plus de, de créer un avatar, il faut pouvoir que la personne le localise, elle puisse le contrôler et elle puisse se l'approprier. Ce corps, c'est le mien. Alors, sur le premier mois, le point, comment créer un corps Donc, on a euh, vu quelques technologies en capture de mouvement en mock-up et le défi est bien sûr d'être en temps réel. Et un des principaux défis de la capture de mouvement, c'est l'occlusion des marqueurs. Donc certains marqueurs vont des fois se retrouver cachés et euh, ça va app faire apparaître certains problèmes dans, lors de la création euh, de cet avatar. Pour cela, on peut utiliser donc des algorithmes afin euh, d'animer, de, de révéler certains éléments cachés comme par exemple une main qui serait en dessous d'une autre. Ensuite, sur le deuxième point, comment animer un avatar Donc, on a vu euh, la création de, de squelettes et euh, de pouvoir euh, les animer, donc pouvoir euh, bouger, euh, et donc avoir des angles articulaires euh, sur, sur un squelette. Et encore une fois, on est capable d'utiliser euh, le machine learning pour pouvoir bouger, parce que sinon, ça demande des calculs qui sont trop longs ou trop complexes. Et donc, par exemple, il nous a présenté « Cool Moves », dans lequel on va animer des avatars de corps complet avec des mouvements de sport. Et pour cela, comment on fait On interpole certains points et ensuite on se base sur des bases de données de mouvements euh, au préalable euh, enregistrées pour pouvoir animer cet avatar. Mais enfin, il a abordé un dernier point qui me semble très important, c'est est-ce qu est -ce que c'est absolument nécessaire d'avoir une telle précision dans l'animation du corps est-ce qu'on est capable, est-ce que la personne serait capable de remarquer s'il y avait quelques différences Et en fait, on se rend compte que euh, les êtres humains, donc nous, nous sommes en fait très tolérants à la distorsion humaine. Donc, c'est-à-dire qu'il peut y avoir un décalage entre la position euh, ou le mouvement d'un avatar et ce qu'on fait dans la réalité. Mais ce qu'ils se sont rendus compte aussi dans son laboratoire, c'est que ce décalage il est différent pour chaque personne. Et donc, ça a un besoin d'une calibration où on va détecter en fait le seuil pour chaque participant au partir duquel ça devient intolérant. Et euh, donc, M. Delahaye travaille sur cette notion de distorsion de corps durant son doctorat. Et enfin, euh, pour conclure, il nous a présenté d'autres exemples de machine learning dans lesquels le machine learning pourrait être utilisé pour améliorer euh, l'expérience utilisateur en réalité virtuelle. Donc, il nous a proposé euh, le motion sickness, donc le, le mal du mouvement hein, euh, qui peut apparaître en réalité virtuelle. Euh, on essaie de trouver d'où ça vient, puis comment améliorer l'expérience de l'utilisateur. On a aussi tout ce qui est reconnaissance de pose, et enfin, la génération de monde virtuel. Merci pour cette présentation très intéressante, Monsieur Delahaye.
Thanks a lot. Thank you.